Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Sal DeSefano, Adam Schaefer and Justin Andrews, full-time podcasters, run Mind Pump, a top-rated fitness and health podcast, and I think maybe even the top. Their aim, or so it seems, is to bring science and truth to the fitness industry and, more importantly, call out all the BS. Skinny Sal, or I've just been told well-endowed Sal, but I think Skinny Sal, we'll stick with that, was managing health clubs at 19, and by 22, he's owned his own gym. After 17 years as a personal trainer, he's joined the boys to form Mind Pump. Moody Boy, or I I don't know if I should say that, but Adam Schaefer is an IFBB, men's physique pro and fitness expert, as well as a certified fitness expert who has brought his entrepreneurial and business skills to Mind Pump. And last but not least, the man of many interesting analogies, Justin Andrews is a fitness professional also shaking up the industry. He's created programs that utilize the latest technology and continues to keep us informed through Mind Pump especially with all the misinformation out there. So, boys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us on. Glad to be here. Look, there's so much to ask you, and even though I've listened to almost all your shows or maybe even all of them, I still feel like there's just so much. So let's get straight into it. In fact, I wanted to do something a bit different. On all my podcasts, at the end of the show, I always ask a question, but I'm actually going to ask you guys at the start just to get to know your voices and to get to know you. So the question I ask all my guests is, do you have a tattoo? Oh, I'll go first since I have we the have least a plethora. Amount. Yeah, yeah, I have the least amount of tattoos. You're the only one with low back tattoo, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have one on my... There's uh, the unicorn yeah, that's flying do- out of his butt crack. I have a dolphin right above my... No, I have um, on my upper back, I have a... So this a is Sal we're tattoo. talking to, right? This is Sal, yes. This is Sal, the, the skinny guy that you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's a version of the... Sicilian, it's called the Trinacria, which is the symbol that is on the Sicilian flag. And it was given to the island of Sicily from the Greeks. It's the head of Medusa with the snakes coming out for hair and three legs around her. And I just got it because both of my parents were born and raised in Sicily from very poor, you know, backgrounds and families. And so it was just something I identified very strongly with as a kid and very proud, you know, growing up middle class from hardworking parents who came from very, very little. So that's the only tattoo I have. That's why I went first. Now you can listen to the so, Adam and Justin. So that, that's not Almost why you went that. first. You always go first, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yep. That's true. This is very true. This is Adam and I've got a full sleeve. So I've got a lot of pieces. Every piece on me has meaning except for the very first one. So I had a tattoo when I was, as soon as I turned 18, I was one of those kids, right? Rebellious went out. I'm getting a tattoo because I'm 18 and I can ran out and did a barbed wire tattoo, you know, just like Pamela Anderson. Oh, that's so bad. (laughs) So I had a a barbed wire tattoo around my bicep for probably the first, I don't know, maybe five, ten years, maybe longer, actually. Ten years I had tattoos. And then I've always wanted a sleeve, and I was always afraid to do a sleeve because I didn't know what kind of job I'd be, and I didn't know if I'd be in this, you know, we're 36 years old, so back when I'm thinking about this as an older teenager, tattoos weren't as accepted as they are now. Now I think it's very cool and it seems like everybody has one now. But back then I wasn't certain on if I wanted to do a full sleeve without being secure in the profession or job or career path that I was going to go because who knew where I was going to be in five, 10 years. There was a certain milestone or a certain place that where once I had accomplished financially is once I got to a place where I felt I was going to be making my own decisions on what I did for a living and work. And I wasn't going to ever have to rely on working for somebody else did I run out and decide, okay, I'm going to do the sleeve that I always wanted? Because I had all these ideas. And most all my pieces, I mean, it would take the whole podcast to probably go over every piece. But for the most part, most of it is to memorialize some of my family members. So my father died when I was seven years old. So there's a cross on there for him. My grandmother, who I lived with when I first moved to the Bay Area, she's on my shoulder. There's parts to that piece that have meaning to me. Then I have pieces on me that are a reminder to be a better man and committed to everything that I do. So I've got a lot of pieces, but every piece on me other than the very first one has a deeper meaning that's related to either family or being a better version of myself or characteristic traits that are important to me. So that's the whole tie-in of my sleeve. Awesome. And so you're going to do another sleeve for the next half of your life? 
you know what? I might. I go back and forth on this. Katrina, my girl, she likes the one sleeve. I keep trying to convince her that I want to get the other one. So I don't. I don't know. I'm. You know, I have a couple pieces. There's a piece I want to do with my sister. It's a, a really neat piece that I'd like to do with her, her and I both. And so I'm not sure where I'm going to put it yet. You know, I wanted to get more, but more recently, I don't know if you guys have noticed, like all the hipsters. Yeah, dorks have tattoos now. Like <laughs> everybody does. All, all the skinny hipsters. Yeah, it makes it less cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. We know one in particular who's <laughs> got <laughs> sleeves and it's like he ruined it. Well, it's changed. <laughs> when we were really young, I think tattoos almost had a bad reputation. I think that people. Well, that- it was rebellious. And I mean, for me, like when I got my tattoos, that was the entire reason was because there were certain things that my dad would always reiterate, like you're going to get kicked out of the house if you do X, Y or Z. And so this was one of those things Like you're going to get kicked out of the house. So I waited till I was actually in college, but I would come home and live, you know, for the summer and everything. And so I was still like apprehensive to get a tattoo, even though I always wanted one. I actually passed it off. The first one I did because I lived in a real religious home. I did a, a cross. I actually passed it off like a henna tattoo for a while. <laughs> you told your parents? <laughs> yeah. I told my dad, I'm like, this is a henna tattoo. No big deal. I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. And then my brother outed me. Yeah, and that became a big deal. And I had, you know, we had gotten this huge fight. Anyways, it all smoothed out. I kind of went along those same lines. And when I was in church, I was very distracted. Like I just, you know, I don't know. I was just looking at stuff. There was this book. It was by Dore, I think was the the artist. And you would do all these like real famous drawings of black and gray art with like angels and demons and all these like crazy imagery. So I basically just took a lot of that and put it on my body. And so I have some angels on my ribs and I have like a devil and on one side and on the other side, like this angel, the horse kind of coming in. And I just love the art of it. So, and then I have like Celtic knots on my back, but other than that, I have plans on kind of continuing my half sleeve on my right arm. And that's about it, really. But like Sal said, it's kind of like lost its luster. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to get a belly button ring because I don't see too many guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting get a that. tongue ring. Hey, can I, t- I had a Let's roommate. Do this. I had a guy roommate that had a belly button ring. I'll never forget that. His no. Was, yeah, Casey. I'll never forget. He worked with, I worked with me at the gym. And, he, and I'll never he forget. He named Casey. I remember, I remember going out to the pool with him. He also did one of those branding tattoos that people do oh, where they burn, burn right. the That's in, just branding. Like That's a, just searing something, a hot iron yes, on your body. Yes, he had yeah, that too. Yeah. Why? So you're not advocating the the mind pump tattoo that I just got put on my... uh... Yes. Oh, no, that's awesome. That would be awesome. This has happened. This has happened. This has happened. We've had somebody actually tattoo the mind pump logo on their body. Yeah. That's when we felt like we officially made it. Wow. (laughs) We we all official. We're like, we're tattooed on some random stranger's body. We made it. All right. (laughs) So on that note, we're actually not just about tattoos on this podcast, but what I actually really want to ask you guys is... I didn't know you when you were 20, but I feel like you guys have come a long way with yourselves in terms of fitness and health. How so? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, that's a great question. I know all of us are very different from when we first started in fitness. But if you go back that far, I mean, for me, everything that drove me in fitness was based on my own personal insecurities with myself. I wanted to be bigger and be stronger. I didn't like being skinny. I felt like I had to build muscle to create this shield, to be this different person and create this different identity. And it's what drove me to make all the decisions in relationship to, you know, with fitness and nutrition, which means a lot of the decisions I made weren't necessarily the best ones. They weren't the healthiest ones. I would force feed myself when I would bulk up and get my body weight. And I'm I'm walking around at about 190 pounds now and I'm relatively lean. I mean, back in those days, I would push my body weight up to 230 pounds. And it was because I would just force food down my throat. And the way I would train was I hated myself. So I'd go to the gym and I would just beat myself up. Although I did get results, I never got what I thought I would get out of it, which was to feel secure in my own skin. And that didn't happen until much later, until I got into my 30s. And I started you know, working with individuals who were in the wellness side of fitness. And because I had respected these individuals so much, I started to learn the other side of fitness, not just the aesthetic side or the performance side, but also the longevity and wellness side. And through that process, it's brought me to where I'm at today to where I really train now for a few different reasons. First, I enjoy the process. I love it. I just love doing it. But I also do it because I care about myself. So rather than beating myself up, it's like I'm taking care of my body. I'm taking care of myself. And the irony of all of this is, I look better now 
I walk around leaner. I walk around with better performance, better movement, better mobility now at 38 years old than I did when I was 22 years old, acting like a jerk in the gym and going crazy. So what a crazy lesson to learn, you know, that if I chase health and longevity and balance, I'll actually get a great deal of the aesthetics that I've always wanted. The funny thing is, it's not even what I'm looking for anymore. I really don't care anymore. I'm already secure. I found that security within myself. I didn't need to find it in external sources. And the cool thing about this process is it drives a lot of my message on the podcast and what we talk about on the podcast. And if you look at us, you know, if your listeners go on our website and look at and see what we look like and or go on our, our social media pages, we look like three meatheads. I mean, we really do. We're three dudes. We like lifting weights. And if you listen to our podcast, we'll talk like that a little bit sometimes. But I think what shocks people is our message is quite different. We do talk about what really works in terms of fitness, what really works in terms of building muscle and fat loss. But we also talk about health. We also talk about the emotional side of fitness, the psychological side of fitness. And really, the, the reason why we talk about those things so much is because we've learned those things for ourselves. Well, the hard way. I think the truth of the matter for many years, I think everyone gets started because of insecurities, right? I think every, most people. I, mean, I think everybody who walks in the gym the first time is walking the gym because there's something that they don't like about themselves. Very few people sign up to work out and say, I'm going to do this because I love myself. Or I want to take care of myself. Most people are driven there through insecurities. And I think just because we're professionals in the field, we're not immune to that. In fact, I think most people that are professionals in the field suffer from that the most because they are driven majorly by that. And that's normally what drove them all the way to reaching these like elite level physiques. And so I think we all have that in common. I also think that for me personally, and I share this on the podcast, our show, that I remember training clients early on. I started early on at 20 years old. I was already a personal trainer. For many years, being a successful trainer, I connected that to finances. Like how much money was I making? How many clients did I have? And I was the best. I was the best in my area. And, and the way I measured that was based off of how much money you were making. And we grew up in that kind of era of the 2000, 2004 dot com era. Everyone kind of had money in the Silicon Valley. Lots of people were buying personal trainers. And it was really who had the most clients. And it wasn't until years later. Did I kind of like reflect back and, you know, I've collected all these trophies of being the best at this. And then I go, God, if I'm really the best, shouldn't I be getting more people results? And shouldn't I have changed more lives? Like, I'm sure I've helped some people. I'm sure, you know, these people I've lost weight here and there. But man, for the amount of people that I've seen, you're talking like 80% of these people have put the weight back on or, or fell off their routine and didn't keep coming. Like, you know, or on the same vicious cycle where they're on or off the wagon, like, how many of these people am I really, truly helping? And it took a good five plus years of being a trainer before I really started to connect those dots. And that really drove me to dive deeper into learning the whole picture. And, and I think that really was when I made that transition from being so focused on macros and, and calories in and calories out type stuff and more towards the psychological piece, because I started to realize mm -hmm. that this is so much bigger than all the other stuff. I mean, getting into what's the best program, what's the best diet, what's all that stuff. Well, if you're fucked up in the head, you're not straight there and you're driven by insecurities, then all that stuff is only going to last you so long and eventually you're going to be off the wagon. So. Yeah, very similar to Adam, but I was coming like, we're talking about 20 years old, total meathead athlete. Everything was based off of measurables. So whatever I could do to increase lifting weights in the gym and whatever I could do to increase my performance on the field. So that mentality kind of drove me. I could basically outwork anybody. So it was always about outworking, going more intense than the person right next to me and accomplishing greater things and winning by all means necessary. And so I think a lot of that stayed with me and that stayed with me going into my first couple of years of personal training. And I had to learn the hard way that and I was getting frustrated because what I was trying to influence my clients, I mean, you could only get so far before they get burned out or they wouldn't come back or, you know, I just wasn't having the same kind of response from them. A lot of them like weren't looking forward to coming in and working with me. And so it was an ego check for me. And I had to really learn, you know, not just the measurables, what are the immeasurables? What are the things that, you know, I can improve upon the stress levels, you know, sleep, recovery. I really had to dive back into mobility, how to treat the body better. 
And that's when everything sort of started to shift. And I started to focus more on that myself. And then I was able to be able to express that better to my clients, get better results. That's kind of carried me to where I am, you know, today. Much, much of the passion, though, that we have on the podcast and the message that we share is because we weren't like we were a bunch of trainers that were taught a certain way and then we were out like manipulating people or we were focusing on the wrong things. It's like we were focusing on all the things that we were taught. And it's kind of an epidemic in the fitness industry right now where it's all built around marketing and sales. And the way all the marketing and sales is driven, regardless of what company, whether it be a supplement company, a gym, whatever you run, you know, we poke at people's insecurities to make them feel guilty for not doing something to sell them. And we were the best at that. We were really good at it. And back then we were being rewarded for the amount of money and revenue that we were driving for the companies that we were working for. But in reality, we weren't really helping people. And I think that message is still predominant in the fitness industry. I think that many people are still doing the same gimmicks, the same shit. And when we all got together one day, we all agreed that like somebody needs to be a voice of reason and just help these people, the consumers, filter through all this bullshit. Yeah, that's a really yeah, that's interesting a really- point. I mean, Justin mentioned stress levels, mobility, and sleep. If you go in looking for a personal trainer and they start talking to you about that, and you're like, no, no, I just want to lose weight. It just doesn't go down well, and, and therefore, to be a what you want to call a successful trainer, obviously, you couldn't really delve into these things because you'll just lose clients left, right, and center. I know you guys are really changing the way that people think about this, which is what I love. And, and then I sort of question, especially for Adam, who trained as a physique professional, surely all of that training, it sort of just goes against now what you sort of truly believe is the best way to train and eat. Yes and no. There's two sides of that coin for sure. I think that when you talk about competing, it's dieting and training at the competitive professional level. Do I think that you can do it and do it in a way that's healthy? I do. I believe that for the most part, you know, my whole process through competing, I stayed really healthy. I stayed within reason. I don't think I was doing damage to my body. I think there's a a huge problem though with people that don't have the knowledge that are hiring coaches, hoping that they have the knowledge that are coaching them through this process. And they're really an amateur in the world of lifting weights and dieting. So that's the biggest bone that I have to pick with the bodybuilding industry is that right now you see women's bikini and men's physique is exploding. And I don't know how, if it's big over where you guys are at, but it's exploded over here because bodybuilding has been around for quite some time and it was popular with Arnold time but it's really exploded in the last five to 10 years. And much of that they attribute to the men's physique and women's bikini categories because now you have these people that look realistic and they look obtainable. Now everybody wants to do it. And in reality, when people call me or they message me and they ask me like, hey, Adam, I want to do a show. I really asked them like, well, have you ever been at, you know, sub six or 7% body fat before? Have you ever tried to you know, diet and train that way first to see if you're even ready to do that. It's like, just because we all drive cars every day, like we have no business getting in a NASCAR race. And I know that, but I drive a car, you know, I lift weights, I I eat, like I understand to that level. Well, yeah, but when you are getting on stage and you have a time and date that you have to be ready for, and you have to bring your physique to this ridiculous level, you're messing with something at a very, very competitive high level And most people probably shouldn't be doing that. Not to mention a majority of the people that lean towards these shows tend to be very insecure and have a lot of poor relationships with food and exercise to start with. And then doing something like that only exaggerates it. So I learned a lot about my own body when I started competing. So I have a lot of positive things to say. I mean, even being a trainer for 15 years, I had never tracked and weighed my food that diligently before in my life, that consistently. And it taught me a ton about all the different macros and how my body responded to each one of those individually. So for those reasons, I can talk about some of the benefits. You know, I think there's a lot to say about measuring, weighing, and tracking food to get you started. But I also, and we talk about this on the show all the time, that is also something that can also become an addiction and a crutch for you also and that we should eventually evolve out of that. Like we should be able to evolve to an intuitive way of eating and an intuitive way of training. But I also think that the most people just aren't there yet either. And so that process is something that some people can benefit from. But I think trying to step into a competitive world when you're an amateur in the dieting world and an amateur in the lifting world, I think it's just 
not smart. It's not a safe thing for people to do it. The main reason why I did it was I knew that these were all the people on the covers of magazines. These are the people that everybody is following on Facebook and Instagram. And they're all the social media stars where all these IFBB pros. And I knew that I had the knowledge and the discipline to take myself to that and to get the attention of others to eventually then pivot over to Mind Pump. And so for me, it was a business strategy. And I used that platform for that reason to have a voice to actually express everything that's really going on behind the scenes when it comes to the bodybuilding world, because there's a lot of fucked up shit. Interesting. And so would you suggest that if our listeners really wanted to sort of get into it, I guess, even just try it? And like you said, there's so many coaches out there that don't really know what they're doing. How would you even go about finding a coach or would you even just go straight to uh, your programs and, and not even worry about getting a coach? Well, before I would even get a coach, I would first prove to myself that I have the discipline and consistency to track my food for nine to 12 weeks. Most people can't even do that. If you don't have the discipline yourself just to track what you're doing, for nine to 12 weeks, and you'll be blown away how much that will just reveal itself. You don't even have to be a nutritionist or somebody that knows exactly what you're doing, but if you don't even know how to start there, then I really don't think you're in a place yet to go to competing. Because again, as using the, the race car analogy, there's levels to this before you should get on a stage and you should compete at the competitive level. I think that if you want to get really lean, because a lot of people tend to do it because they want to get in shape and they use competing as a way to help them get in shape. They use it as a motivation. It, it reminds me of when we would train clients and they would sign up for a marathon to get into shape. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people right now that are signing up for a show because I want to get in shape and I know this is going to motivate me to get in shape. That is the wrong reason. Right. That is the absolute wrong reason, reason to do a show. And to be honest, look, even if you're doing everything healthy, the last few weeks leading up to a show are unhealthy. Right. Even if you're doing everything right, now you're crossing into the unhealthy stage where you get adaptive thermogenesis, so your body starts to slow its metabolic rate down where hormone issues become an issue, especially with women. Most women lose their period completely leading up to a show because they get too lean. They get so lean because obviously you want to be lean to be on stage. So they have to deal with that. So, And then they come to us afterwards. I can't tell you how many messages we get from ex-competitors who say, oh, I did three shows or I did four shows. And you know, my gut health is all over the place. All of a sudden, I can't eat these foods or my hormones are all over the place. My hair is falling out. I have no libido. You know, again, I, I lost my period or, or men saying my testosterone is in the tank. Like, what's going on? And then we play this kind of repair game. You know, we're trying to get... I mean, at, you know, the, end of, at the end of the day, it's a sport. It's a sport just like football or basketball. Exactly, or exactly. And, and a lot of our listeners are actually endurance athletes and I can totally relate to what you're saying. And the same symptoms come with endurance athletes. It's interesting to see that it's really across the board with anyone that takes a sport to that level. I think the misconception is because you're getting in shape and your, your body looks awesome. So people look at it like, oh, this is healthy. This yeah. is healthy. When in reality, if you just looked at it like a sport, just like you said, it's a perfect analogy with endurance running. It's the same thing. Like if you're an endurance runner, you know that if you got a bad knee and running on it 20 miles, it's probably not an ideal. You know that, but it's your sport. You love it. You push through, you endure, and you know you're making that sacrifice. Like, so when you get into competing, you're making health sacrifices in order to do that. And I really think that the scary part with that is there's a lot of very unqualified people giving some really poor advice for these people because so many people are, there's a ton of money to be made. There's so many people that want to get on stage and compete because they do think it's a representation of health and think that this will get them in the best shape now, of their lives. Now, I do think it's important to note that there are real benefits that you can learn from competing at high levels for yourself, not necessarily being at a high level in your sport because not everybody can do that, but pushing your body. There's definitely things you learn about mm -hmm. yourself, about your capabilities when you do that. But what I like to tell people is develop a solid foundation first, a healthy solid foundation where you know your body, you're eating healthy, you're exercising appropriately, everything's in balance, you feel really good. You're already naturally performing at a decent level. Now to take it to that extreme level, all sports at high levels are unhealthy. That's just a fact. All sports, yeah. if you push yourself that well, I like that, especially you want to find that homeostasis. That's first. it. So it's like you have to figure out what that even looks like. And a lot of people haven't put in the work to actually find out where they operate best. And now now I can press on that further in this direction or this direction. Hey, These sports are different directions on 
pressing intensively the body and you have to know how to be able to come back to it's your home base here's the deal if you need to hire a coach because you don't know how to do your own macros then you don't have any business competing straight up now that being said almost every ifbb pro has a coach but most of those guys have coaches for accountability purposes and a second pair of eyes but every one of those guys should understand macros and what their body needs, protein, carbs, fats. If you haven't done your homework and you haven't put the time in to learn about that, again, using the car racing analogy, if you don't know how to drive a stick, there's no reason for you to be in there trying to race a car just because you can drive a car. There's steps to that you should be taking before you try and get competitive with it. And if you already feel the need that you need to hire a coach because you don't even know where to start your diet, what makes you think that coach knows about your body and where it needs to be. Even the best coach in the world. Like my first bit of coaching anybody, I tell them before a show, because I used to coach athletes, I would say, listen, you can't pick a show and then hire me. I won't take you on as a client. I want you a minimum of three months before we would even have to head into prep. And what those three months are for me is to learn that person's metabolism because I know damn well that everybody is unique and different. No matter how many times I've done this, no matter how many girls that weigh 110 pounds that I've coached for bikini, Every single one of them have a different metabolism, have a different body that responds differently to the nutrition that I give it, to the cardio that I give it, to the weight training program that I give it. So if that's true, how could you hire me to get ready for a show and I just print something out for you? Like that's a crock of shit. It's as simple as ramp and water. (laughs) (laughs) I knew Justin would come in with an analogy somewhere. (laughs) I won't even go there. But I don't know. Hopefully that may, I know I'm rambling yeah, around no. right now on my soapbox. You never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's interesting to just to see it across the sports. And, and you mentioned accountability and, and Sal also mentioned motivation with, you know, they find a marathon to do. And, and that's very true across triathletes and athletes. They look for, well, what can I have in front of me to make me actually get up in the morning and train? I personally just couldn't train like that. I just do it because I love it, not because there's an event coming up. But it's quite interesting to see, you know, what motivates people and what they need to be accountable. But I really wanted to ask you guys, obviously, we're all about not just being fit, but being healthy and longevity. And and I know this is your message. So I'm wondering if you could help a lot of our listeners who do a lot of training, especially in the endurance world, where you see injuries more and more so. And you see that even now, strength training still isn't recognized enough in this area. And I know you guys have your own programs that you've written specifically for people like this. Can you let us know a bit more about your performance programs and which ones they should be doing and and how, say, endurance athletes should be training for strength? Absolutely. So when it comes to resistance training, there's the obvious that it helps you with. It obviously can make you stronger. And strength is the foundation of all other physical pursuits. So strength is one of those things that if you build strength appropriately, if you do it the right way, it will contribute to pretty much anything else that you do, whether it involves speed or endurance or, you know, agility. If you have more strength behind it, you're going to do better. So that's the obvious. But then there's the other stuff that's less obvious. And this is where I think a lot of people miss the boat when it comes to resistance training. Resistance training is by far the best form of exercise for preventing muscle imbalances and overuse injuries, mainly because resistance training is very moldable. So if we look at all forms of exercise, if we take running, for example, There's only so many different ways you can modify running, but it's all the same. It's all running one foot in front of the other. Well, when I use resistance training, I can change the angles. I can change the resistance. I can change the tension. I can change the speed and the tempo and the reps. I can modify the intensity and the frequency all based around the individual. So if I have somebody who's coming to see me and I notice that they have forward shoulder and an anterior pelvic tilt, for example, so forward shoulder, just like it sounds, shoulders roll forward that posture that you'll see computer engineers will get, or that anterior pelvic tilt, that's where the low back arches excessively and the butt kind of sticks out and people tend to have issues with their low back and their hip flexors. And you actually see these problems sometimes show up in runners. If somebody comes to me with those issues, I know specifically what movements and exercises that I can apply to change recruitment patterns in that person's body so that when they go do their sport or their exercise, their favorite form of exercise, whatever it may be, whether it's swimming, running, biking, football, baseball, whatever, 
their body's going to move more optimally. And one thing we want to understand with the human body is there's two things that contribute to optimal movement. One is your body learns how to move as well as it can move in the pattern that you train it in. That's number one. But number two is that there is an ideal pattern. And they aren't always the same thing. And what I mean by that is if I'm doing a sport, let's say I'm a swimmer and I'm getting really fast. But if you looked at my form, if somebody, if there was like a really good coach that saw my swim form and said, hey, look, you know, I know you're swimming fast, but I'm watching you swim. And if you continue with that form, you're going to hurt your shoulder or, you know, you're not as efficient as you can be. Well, at that moment, my body's at best moving the way that I'm always moving. It's become very good at it. Now, the way I back out of that is I can train it with resistance. So I can slowly move into a more optimal pattern and now I'm going to move even better. And I use the analogy of typing. It's like if I always typed with my two index fingers on a keyboard and I did that for the last 15 years, I'll get pretty fast with my two index fingers. And I'll actually be faster with my index fingers than I will be if I try to use all my fingers. That is until I learn how to type with all of my fingers and I practice and over time, that becomes much more efficient and effective because it's just a better pattern. And this is what resistance training provides that is so valuable, especially to endurance athletes. And the reason why it's so valuable to endurance athletes is because the very nature of endurance training involves lots of repetitive, long, you know, type of movement. So Mm -hmm. if I'm a runner and I'm running 20 or 30 or, you know, yeah, if I'm running, you know, 20, 30 miles a week, that's a lot of practice of a particular pattern. That's a lot of the same stuff over and over and over and over again. And I could be developing patterns that can cause problems. At the least, it's going to make me inefficient at my sport. At the most, I'll notice issues like iliotibial band syndrome or knee pain or hip pain or ankle pain or back pain or you know hip flexor issues or psoas syndrome or whatever, all the common things. But with resistance training, I can go in and I can make sure that I'm not causing those problems by training appropriately. And that's what's wonderful about resistance training. Well, it's just resisting external forces. It's having the ability to control and decelerate comfortably. Nothing does that better than working out with weights. It's in a controlled situation, like a controlled angle. But at the same time, what you're doing is we're building upon a responsibility to be able to maintain that joint integrity. Well, this is why, too, our most revolutionary and popular program that we sell is our MAPS Prime program, which is actually an assessment piece. So if you just started to do weight training and let's say you're a runner, like we're talking about, and you also just go right into weight training, well, you're also going to have bad patterns there too, because you've created bad patterns through all those years of running and not weight training properly. So biomechanically, you're probably going to be off. And that's why we created prime was to help people assess their own movement. So, and we broke Mm -hmm. the body up into three basic zones to keep it easy for the, the average consumer. It's an at home test. They take it and it's either pass or fail. Either one, you can perform the movement correctly and perfect, or you can't. And if you can't, there's work to be done there. And where there's work to be done, there's a compass that drives you in the direction of all the movement patterns that you should be doing to help correct that imbalance so you can move properly. So that to me is the important piece though, because if you just tell somebody who's a runner, like, hey, you know, strength training is important. You need to get in the gym and just strength train. Well, yeah, they will get some benefits because they'll build some strength and building muscle helps support the bones and stuff like that. But at the same time, if you don't go back and address all the imbalances that you've probably caused over years and you don't correct that through resistance training, then you still could potentially be just making that issue worse. And the good news with resistance training is this. You don't need to do a ton of it. Now, if your goal is to build maximum strength and muscle over time, you will be in the gym, you know, pretty regularly. But if your chosen sport is an endurance sport, if you're a cyclist or a runner or a swimmer, and that is your chosen sport, really, I'm not even making this up, one or two days a week of moderate resistance training, appropriate resistance training for your body is plenty. Mm -hmm. You'll get a huge return in your performance, both in your speed. So you'll notice, you know, your times will start to come down, but you'll also notice you just feel better. You recover faster from your training sessions. And you'll have less issues with pain. And of course, that translates into longevity with your sport. Because, you know, here's one of the things. If you're somebody that really enjoys what you do, you don't want that to be taken away from you by something as silly as an injury, as something that is preventable. And most injuries in endurance sports are not the result of acute 
problem. It's not like someone fell down. Like I hurt myself because I fell while I was running or I crashed my bike. You know, that's tragic when it happens. But usually the problems that people encounter are these avoidable issues that are a result of overuse issues or the result of our muscles not responding. Yeah. The imbalance is like, oh, my knee got really bad and now I need, you know, knee surgery or my back bothers me all the time. My shoulder's always hurting or whatever. Like these are things that you could totally avoid with the proper application of resistance training. And Adam's completely right. MAPS Prime is the perfect program for that. It's not necessarily standalone, like here's your weight training program. It was it just designed highlights, for you know, maybe where your muscles aren't very active and where they should be active in being able to kind of support and maintain proper positioning for your joints to move in their optimal way. So ideally then, would we be best using, say, that's prime combined with, say, the performance program? Yes, that that's would be combo. That would be a fantastic combination, MAPS performance and MAPS prime. But it depends on how... Yeah, much. How, how much of an endurance athlete are yeah, you? Like so, if you're running five days a week, yeah, then you don't need to, Prime is plenty. Yeah, then yeah. Maps Prime is plenty because that's just to fix your imbalances. Yeah. If right. you're somebody who's like, oh, I like to run, but I also want to build some muscle and take care of my body, then performance and Prime together would be ideal. But it really, each person, it would be different. And, the, and yeah, that's, if, if you're looking for more balance and you just you want good functional performance, including endurance, then yeah, definitely add mass performance. But like I was saying, if you're a hardcore endurance athlete, Add maps prime and that's it because you wouldn't have room nor would your body be able to recover right. from Perform- adding so much performance more. Performance is three days a week in the gym. So if you're running more than three days a week and you're leaning more towards caring more about your sport, then we probably would just encourage someone to use prime to complement that. But if you're somebody who's kind of in the middle where you, yeah, two to three days a week I run, but then I would love to lift two to three days a week, then yeah, absolutely performance and prime would be awesome. Because mm, maps prime doesn't really take up too much time either, does it? No, it's got fortification workouts, which are correctional. So they're totally correctional in nature. So you're not necessarily going into the gym to build maximum strength or muscle. You're going in there to create optimal recruitment patterns. And then it also teaches you how to prime your workout. So before you go on your run, it will individualize what you do before you go on your run for your body so that your body is firing more optimally. It responds, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And that's a 10, 15-minute session yeah. before you go it's to like your run. like a supercharged warm-up. Okay. Exactly. So what about those of us who do want to get stronger and perhaps even build muscle mass? You mentioned regular gym workouts, and I know you're a big fan of body split workouts. What's your take on, say, uh, recently I interviewed Lawrence Neal, who's a big advocate of HIT and the Doug McGuff sort of style where, you know, maybe two sessions of 15 minutes a week's enough. Oh, so are you talking about high intensity training yeah. of resistance? Yeah. Okay, so definitely not a big fan of that, and I'll tell you why. So, not if, not if your goal is building muscle. Yeah. Or I mean, here's the thing: intensity is one of the factors that will tell the body to adapt or build muscle and get strength, but it's not the only factor. You also have volume; that's the total amount of work that you're doing, and then you have frequency, the amount of times that you train that particular area of the body throughout the week. Now, when you're going all out full intensity and only doing 15 minutes, you're negating the other factors and the body adapts very, very quickly. And what you'll find is if you train that way, you'll get results in a very short period of time and then your body will plateau. It can be very very intense and taxing for the central nervous system because you're going max effort, right? So you're always pushing yourself to the max effort. You're always hitting that rev limiter. Not not to mention this is also when most of your imbalances are going to come out the most. When you're pushing explosive and quick, like plyometric type and, work, jump, burpee stuff, that's, you always see that with hits. Hits always got some sort of an explosive movement in there to get the heart rate up. The science that supports it, right, is obviously if we push the body like that, like Sal was saying, intensity is a signal that's going to help do that. But then on top of that, too, you're burning more calories because your heart's pounding like crazy. And so you get the benefits of leaning out a little bit and you get the benefits of building muscle a little bit. But there are much more effective ways to build muscle if you want to build well, muscle. Well, I'll tell you what. We've been trainers for a long time, right? I could take a completely deconditioned, you know, hasn't worked out for 10 years, individual off the street, and I can train them every single day, every day, seven days a week, now with the right intensity and with appropriate exercises. Now, that I cannot do that with someone. I can't take someone off the street who's deconditioned and train them max intensity for 15 minutes without they're causing some problems. And that's just to give you an example of the difference between the two. You can train frequently. You can train a particular type of volume if you monitor the intensity. Max intensity is not appropriate for a lot of people. You can cause a lot of different problems. 
And the body doesn't necessarily respond to that long term. You want to be able to manipulate these different factors that tell the body to adapt. And intensity is just one of them. And unfortunately, it seems to be one that is abused the most in more recent it's years. It's the most flashy, right? Well, like frequency is not something that everybody's like putting out there marketing wise. That right. being said, if somebody who's never done HIIT workouts before, and let's say they you know, subscribe to the guy that you were referring to, who's all about 15 minute right. HIIT workouts, and they follow his program for the first four to six weeks, if they're not doing anything, and then all of a sudden they incorporate this 15 minute HIIT workouts, they're going to burn calories. Yeah, they're going to build, they're gonna build yeah. some muscle. 100% they will. I mean, that's just a fact. But real quick, they'll become adapted to that. So real quick, their body will now become efficient at doing these little 15-minute hit workouts. And then now maybe the change is not going to happen at the same rate that it was happening two, three weeks before that. In terms of muscle building, studies are pretty conclusive on this now. When you hit a muscle with whatever amount of intensity, the appropriate amount of intensity, whether that's high or a little lower, depending on the individual, we will see a muscle building signal that rises very quickly after the exercise or after the workout, and it peaks at about anywhere between 24 to 72 hours, and then it drops very quickly, regardless of whether or not the muscle is still recovering. So even though you still may be sore two or three days later, and you still feel like, oh, my body's still healing, that muscle building signal has fallen and may even start to go in the negative. So I think people make a mistake and they think that recovery is the muscle building process, but it isn't. It's actually it can be separate. It can be part of it, but it can be separate. This is why studies show if you take you know, a bunch of people and you train their legs for 21 sets of heavy squats on Monday and you wait till the following Monday and you compare them to a group that instead of doing 21 sets on Monday, does seven sets on Monday, seven sets on Wednesday, seven sets on Friday, same total volume, but triple the frequency. The people who work out and split it up over three days far superior results. Every single study done on this has demonstrated that it's far superior to train the body, the entire body, anywhere between two to four times a week versus super intensely, you know, once or twice a week. And that's both for strength and muscle mass? Absolutely for strength and muscle mass, definitely. Mm, excellent. Well, thank you for that. And guys, before I let you go, I really want to ask your opinion because I know you're really well read. You often talk about the books that you read and, and I know Irresistible and Inevitable have been two that you've read recently. And given your knowledge on those books and also the great conversations you have with experts on the podcast. So we, funny. Yeah. <laughs> Interrupt me. That's all it's right. so funny. No, no, sorry. I, I thought yeah. you were, it's so funny to bring that up. The boys have been teasing me for bringing up Irresistible. He needs I, to get paid for every all episode. <laughs> well, I, I, I was, I was going to ask you if you've got some sort of shares in the, in the book. But it is a great book. And so based on sort of, I guess, your knowledge of the industry, where do you think the fitness industry is going in terms of technology, not just technology, but also you see fads like Orange Theory, and I know you guys have got some great podcasts about that, and CrossFit and, and all these sort of different, I guess, philosophies popping up here and there. Where do you think it'll be, say, in 20 years? What will it look like? I think there's two major camps here. I think there is one camp that is fully adopting all the tech and where we're heading and absolutely love it and see all the perks and the benefits of it and support it and say, this is awesome. And there's everybody else doing dinosaur training. And then there is the other side, like Dr. Andy Galpin and books like Irresistible, where they're kind of waving these flags saying, hang on here, we're getting too plugged in and we're becoming detached from our own selves. And this could become a problem in the future, which is what Adam Atler talks about in the book Irresistible is we start staring at our phones and becoming more and more dependent on all these tools that give us feedback that we actually become more detached than actually connected to our body. It's so reflective of nutrition, in my opinion, in that we talk a lot about like there's steps, there's layers of priorities of like how to approach what to think about first. And the first thing is awareness. Like what, what am I actually putting into my body? And then, you know, going through that, you track, right? So same thing with training. It's the thing now, it's this race, right? It's this race to find some kind of a gadget that's going to tell you something about your body that you didn't know before. And which is really cool. And, and there's a lot of like promising data that's coming out that is showing you more insight as far as you know, what your body's capable of or what you're doing on a consistent basis and maybe one little micro tweak that you can do to kind of change this. However, this becomes a problem because people are going to stay 
there and they're going to stay in this place where they're dependent on this step counter. They're dependent on this heart rate monitor. They're dependent on all this like biofeedback that's going to determine all of their moves. And they're not thinking for themselves anymore. You have to look at all these things that are coming out. They're just tools. And are they really providing you information that you need on a consistent basis? Or is this just something Mm -hmm. that's good insight that you can take and then you can apply and then be removed from it? Yeah, I think you say 20 years from now, which is a while, right? I think if you say 20 years from now, you're going to continue to see the growth of community-based fitness classes like CrossFit really popularized it and Orange Theory, like you mentioned, getting people to kind of work out together. But I think you're going to see technology involved there where people have augmented reality or where they're going to put on their glasses and they're going to see Mm -hmm. themselves around their friends and they're working out together. And then the other movement that's already in in full swing, which it's starting to gain steam and it's going to keep getting bigger, is the melding of fitness and wellness and health. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, when we first started Mind Pump, we talked about this you had this huge divide between health and then you had the fat loss and muscle building crowd and they never talked to each other. It was never any crossover. Well, you're starting to see that crossover and it's all becoming one. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future where people, where meditation becomes a bigger part of fitness, where people learn to eat a little more intuitively. That's going to become a bigger thing. I think it has to go in that direction because up until now, fitness has not been the answer to the health epidemic, but I think it will become the answer. I think people are starting to learn that what we eat, what we put in our mouth is far more important than we thought before. And it's not just proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and calories. That food quality is important. Things like organic foods are gaining more and more popularity. And where people's food comes from is going to become much more important where people are going to look at a chicken and they're going to say, okay, not only does that look nice, but I want to know where it come from, where it ate, you know, what it ate, you know, what kind of sunshine it got, like all these different things. Those are all going to start becoming important factors in the market, uh, fitness and health. Listen, at the end of the day, these are all tools. And the argument that I have with people that are anti all these tools is like, listen, if you can learn to use it to help become more aware of your body and how your body responds, it's like I, I use Fat Secret, my fitness pal type of apps where you track your food. I use my Fitbit, my Fitbit I'm wearing right now. I use Hydrostatic Way to get my body fat tested. And all these things are cool tools that we have now. HRV I've played around with. All of them just help me learn more about myself. And if you approach it like that, we're in an incredible time. I mean, 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. I was the kid who had the Calorie King book and I had a notepad After I ate something, I would have to go back in the book. I'd have to figure out what it was. Then I'd write it down. Then I'd add it up. I mean, it was a nightmare where now you could take a picture of your fucking food. and You just scan food and you're going to know all the minerals, all the nutrients, everything like immediately. And you're going to be able to put that into your data like instantaneously. So I actually, when I was coaching people, it was mandatory that you owned a Fitbit and you use Fat Secret, but I coached it in a way where I taught people how to use it as an awareness tool. Like, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. Week one of coaching with me, I'm not putting you on a diet. I'm not telling you to do a program right now. I want you to be normal you. And if normal you doesn't go to the gym and normal you sits on the couch and has a Snickers at seven o'clock at night every night, I want you to do that. But all I want you to do is report it. And then after you report it, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about your movement because I have you tracking with your Fitbit so I know how mobile you are if you're somebody who sits on their ass all day long or you're up and around walking around. And then I want to look at your food and I want to see your eating patterns. And then from there, I'm going to use that tool to make you aware of the things that you're doing well and the things you're not doing so well and where we can get better at that. I think we're in an awesome time that we have tools like this, especially for professionals like myself to use. I think the scary part when you read a book like Irresistible is the behavioral addiction that comes with it. You know, and nobody really talks about that because these are all things for health and they're all positive, but there is a behavioral pattern that happens to us where, you know, we become dependent on it. A perfect example of this for myself is the introduction of Waze and TomToms or whatever navigation system that you guys have over there. I mean, I used to pride myself on being somebody who could find his way around anywhere and I've become so dependent on this thing to tell me how to get to mattress that I use it in my own town, my own town that I know all the streets all over the place. You get lost. Yeah, yeah, I get lost (laughs) in my own town. And that is an example Mm -hmm. of how dependent I've become 
on this thing to the point that if all of a sudden my oh, phone yeah, same thing could happen right if my if my phone blew up i would be fucking lost in my own city like that's ridiculous but that's because i've become so dependent on this technology <laughs> it's no different when it comes to taking care of your body and health and all these tools we can get sucked into where we actually think we're becoming more attached but we're actually becoming more detached from ourselves because we're reliant on something else to give us feedback Mm, I love it. And it's, mm, it's, love it's it. true in, in anything, isn't it? Like even social media that you rely on that, that gives you feedback right. to say whether you're, you're doing a good job with your podcast, you know. Do you think it's about choosing your, like Andy Galpin talks about this a lot. He's like, you choose your, what are your limitations? What are your ground rules? Because if you don't set those for yourself, then it's so easy to surpass those and then potentially, you know, get carried away with calorie counting and become orthorexic and all sorts of issues can come about. So do you guys personally have sort of set, I guess, uh, rules around how you use technology and media? So it's difficult. It's very, very difficult because we also have the excuse of it being our business. Yeah. I could see how it'd be much easier if it wasn't something that I needed to do for my business because that's an easy excuse. I can say, Oh, well, I'm working right now. This is what I need to do. But for myself personally, if I'm with my kids or if I'm with someone that's important to me, I will make a conscious effort to mute my phone, put it in my pocket or put it face down and not look at it and not check it and try to pay attention to the person in front of me. And then the second thing is I turn off all my electronics about an hour before I go to bed. So at least an hour before I go to bed, I turn everything off. And I'm just in the house with either dim lights or candlelight and just kind of unplugging it contribute to better sleep quality as a result. But it's a difficult thing to manage because it's a new thing mm -hmm. to manage. It's not something that we've ever had to historically ever had to deal with before. It reminds well, me of... Most people don't recognize <laughs> it as a problem yet. That's it. And it reminds me of when processed foods became so prevalent in the market. It became easy to get food. And they all tasted really good. They were all engineered and designed to taste a particular way. And all of a sudden, people overate the hell out of them because it was a new problem. We never had to worry about that before because before the problem was we didn't have enough food. And now it's a completely new thing. And so we've had to learn how to navigate that. It reminds me of that, you know, with technology. It's totally new. We've only really had it in a big way for the last 10 to 15 years. And you're going to have to put in those parameters because it's not going to happen naturally, not until you work with parameters and really become aware with how they affect you and then get to the point where you're more intuitive about it. I definitely need to track well, being, how much I use Well, being my phone. completely transparent, I think that this is a major focus. In fact, Katrina and I were literally just talking about this two nights ago that in 2018, one of my New Year's goals, I actually want to schedule a whole day of shutting down technology in the week and make that a habit of mine. And I have similar things that I've done. I shut down at seven o'clock is when I try to. But I tell you what, if there's any rules that I break with myself right now, it's that one, which is also why I was so passionate about sharing Irresistible. And the boys tease me because I keep talking about it every time we get on a show because I'm like, more people need to hear this message because right now we're celebrating all these cool things, right? We're talking about how awesome Instagram and Facebook and having a social media business and all oh, whatever. Everything is so accessible. What a great time that we can do podcasting and make a business out of it. So we're talking about how great all these things are, but no one's talking about there's always a cause and effect. And mm. some of the effects from this are the behavioral addictions that are happening. And I've seen it with myself. I'm a very self-aware person and I know when I'm addicted to something, when I can't go somewhere without my phone, that's an issue. Like I didn't have that issue 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, that wasn't a problem, but I recognize it now. And so, you know, part of me speaking passionately about it isn't because I'm over here up all high and mighty and I've got this all figured out where I'm in balance. No, this is a fucking struggle for me. And so I know I can't be alone in this. There's got to be other people that are building social media businesses or utilize these tools and it's a major tool for them. But then you also got to realize, is it hurting your relationships? And I started to notice that I could be sitting down next to my girl and I've been on my phone for an hour, not even giving each other attention. Like those are things that I, I don't want to let it consume me just because I have a business that, you know, supports our family based off of how much time I can spend on it. I need to be more efficient with it and have times where I shut down. And I and I truly think if you learn to put that in place that you could still be very, very effective and still accomplish a lot. It is a challenge. 
Mm, mm. I love it. And I think guys like you can help more and more people not only become aware of it but maybe even become accountable, having detox technology days like you're talking about, Adam, and then just getting everyone to be involved with that. Right. Mm. Tell us on – oh, no, don't tell us on social media how you're going today. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Look, guys, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm mindful of your time and really appreciate your insights. And obviously, our listeners will go to all of your Instagram, social media, your new website. We'll put all of that in our show notes. And thanks again. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.